Shall we pray? And now, God, we thank and praise you for bringing us to this moment in this place. Surrounded, God, by your presence. Hear, God, to give you praise. Now, God, as we assemble in the sanctuary, continue, God, to fill this place with your spirit. Not just the physical walls, God, but the hearts, the minds, the bodies of all of our beings. Fill them, God, with your presence that we might be empowered as we worship. Empowered, God, as your word is proclaimed. Empowered, God, as we come and commune at your table. Empowered, God, as we worship and fellowship with you, O Lord, in the beauty of holiness. Continue, God, having your way. And even in the midst of the technical glitches, God, still be God. Save sinners now, God, and strengthen the saints by your word and by your mighty works. In Jesus' name we pray. And all the people of God, they did say amen and amen and amen again. Amen. We thank God and praise God to be here and in the house of the Lord one more time. Once again, to all of you visiting with us, if I didn't greet you earlier, I'm greeting you now, saying glad to have you with us in the house on today. Amen. Both in person and those of you online. Amen. Amen. And I must give uh, reverence to uh, the senior bishop of the CME Church, the presiding prelate of the 8th Episcopal District, who is our bishop. Amen. Right here and right now in the person of Bishop Lawrence Reddick. Amen. Who is uh, here with us on today. Amen. Now, let me let me tell y'all right now. He already texted me earlier. Amen. And told me he was going to be here and told me. Amen, that, I, that uh, he may or may not, amen, want to be the chief celebrant. He said not, but I'm trying to be good because folk online are watching, amen, uh, uh, exercise his right to be the chief celebrant uh, for communion. So don't y'all be pointing and nudging and texting and all that stuff when we come to the table, amen. He knows who he is, is comfortable in who he is, amen. And we never mean any disrespect, amen, to our leadership when you don't see them functioning in capacities where we believe they ought to function, amen. I don't know what the devil is doing because I'm not an expert in the devil, uh, but uh, I'm beginning a series of messages today on dealing with the demonic. And I don't know if the fact that most of my sermon notes vanished, amen, right before I got to the sanctuary is the demonic or if it's just a bad device, amen. I'm going to blame the device. Come with me, if you will, to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. Very familiar passage of scripture, but I don't want to look at the most familiar part. I want to look at the precursor to the most familiar uh, passage of scripture that we find in Ephesians uh, chapter 6. Amen. Ephesians chapter 6. I think I'm going to look at verse 11, verse 12, and maybe just for good measure, the A clause of verse 13. Amen. When you have it, we are resting on our feet. Amen. Just to let the blood circulate. Amen. Through our veins. Amen. Some of us have been sitting for way too long need the blood to move around just a little bit. Amen. Sister Hobson, won't you just wave your hand? Amen. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you in the house. Amen. Just one more time. Amen. I don't want to tell all of her testimony, but Sister Hobson's daughter, Saritha, uh, was in the hospital. She was in ICU uh, when I first saw her about two weeks ago. I think it was two or three weeks ago when I first saw her. She was in ICU. I went back a second time and she was in a regular hospital room, amen. I was gonna go see her yesterday, but I called her mom and said, where's Sarita? She said she in a rehab, amen, in a rehab and getting better and better day by day. See, y'all missed it. That was your chance to give God praise. Amen, amen. God is doing a great work, amen, in her life, and we thank God and praise God for progress. You may not see the difference all at once, but one thing is certain, that God is always doing what only God can do. And sometimes we pay so little attention, we don't notice it until it's done. But he that has begun a good work in her and in all of us who may find ourselves sick, may God continue to perform it until it is complete. 
the book of Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse number 11, there we find these words. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Amen. I like that. I like verse 11, especially put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. Again, I'm starting a five part series. So I pray that the bishop sends me back next year so that I can finish the series. Amen. Uh, next month, but I'm starting a five part series titled dealing with the demonic. And I want to tag this text and share from this thought, identifying demonic demonic enemies. Amen. Identifying demonic enemies as you take your seats in the presence of the Lord. This year marks my 31st year preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. I was 13 years old going on 14 when I acknowledged that God had called me to preach and preached my first sermon at St. Paul CME Church in Chicago in 1993. Now at 45 years old, I can say that I've been preaching for most of my life. I preach that God is good. I preach that God is love. I preach that God is faithful. I preach that the ultimate demonstration of God's goodness, God's love, and God's faithfulness is that God has given us his only begotten son named Jesus of of Nazareth. I preached that Jesus was born of a young girl named Mary, that he was crucified on a cross on a hill called Calvary, that he was buried in a borrowed grave, and three days later, God raised him up just like God said he would. I preached that there is no other name given among men nor women whereby we must be saved, for God has highly exalted his son Jesus and given him a name above every name. How high is it? It is so high that at the name of Jesus, every knee has got to bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue has got to confess that he is Lord to the glory of of God. I preach that to seal the work of Jesus Christ the Son to save us, that God has given us God's Holy Spirit to seal us and to strengthen us, and that through the power of God's Holy Spirit we can live liberated lives. And while I may not be the best when it comes to preaching, I think I'm a pretty good preacher. That was the pause for your applause. Uh, while I may not be the best at it, I think I'm pretty good at it because I preach what God says preach and I don't preach anything that God tells me not to preach. So in 31 years of preaching, I have never preached about the demonic. Why? Because God called me to preach God's good news and not what the devil is doing. God called me to preach God's word and not the devil's word. God called me to preach about how God works and not about how the devil works. God has called me to preach God's truth and not the devil's tactics. Yet in the 32 years I've been a Christian and in the 31 years I've been preaching God's word, I have met some Christians who know more about the demonic than they know about the divine. 
They know more about evil and unclean spirits than they know about the Holy Spirit. They know more about what the devil does and how the devil operates than they know about God and how God operates. Don't act like you haven't seen them around lately. They are denouncing and disassociating themselves from fraternities and sororities because they say they are demonic. They're saying don't sing the school song at Spelman or other HBCUs because it's demonic. People are all over TikTok and YouTube posting hours long videos getting hundreds of thousands of views calling everything and everybody demonic. People don't like them, so they call those people demonic. Couldn't get accepted into the organization, so they call it demonic. Finally getting attention from females who used to friend zone them, but now they got favor because they joined the frat, so they call it demonic. Can't afford to stay financial in the sorority, so they call it demonic. Barely graduated, so they call education demonic. When they don't understand it, they call it demonic. When somebody tries to help them see right because they don't recognize they are wrong, they call it demonic. It seems like everything and everybody has been labeled demonic. Even church folk, folk who go to church, are calling other church folk demonic because you weren't baptized the right way, right way. They call it demonic. And this is the problem that the writer of Hebrews who, who has in the background of today's pericope. For in the epistle commonly attributed to Paul and seemingly intended for multiple Christian communities, Communities, it alludes to communities that are in conflict because in the background of the text there is a racial conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles. Why? Because the Jews and the Gentiles look differently and physical differences often lead to debate on which one is better. In the background of the text there is a religious conflict between the Jewish and the Gentile followers of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jewish followers of Jesus saw themselves as chosen by God from the beginning while their Gentile counterparts were choosing God in the end. You know how it is when people who have been saved longer than you think they are better than you. You, you know how it is when folk who've been a member of the church since they were a child need to teach you and train you how to do church because you you showed up as an adult, there's a religious conflict in the background of the text. But not only is there a religious conflict in the text and a racial conflict in the text, but in the background of the text, there's a conflict over rituals between those who had been circumcised and those who were uncircumcised. They, they were saying things like, if you didn't do it this way, you didn't do it the right way. You were baptized by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. Uh-uh. If you weren't immersed, you didn't do it the right way. Also in the background are relational conflicts between husbands and wives, fathers and children, enslaved and free. Why? Because people with titles want to be elevated above you and rule over you instead of just working with you. And these conflicts in the background were causing chaos and confusion in the community. Why? Because people were preoccupied with overcoming each other instead of overcoming what was really oppressing them. All oh, sounds so good. I'm going to say it again. I said people were so preoccupied with overcoming each other that they were not focusing on overcoming what was really oppressing them. It sounds a whole lot like us, doesn't it? 
because we today are fighting over race. We are fighting over religion. We are fighting over rituals. We are fighting over relationships. We are fighting over money. We are fighting over means. And in the fight to get what we want, we call everything else demonic. We are calling whole ethnic groups demonic. We call Christian traditions demonic. We are calling cultural expression demonic. We are calling relationships toxic or demonic. We are calling Republicans demonic. We are calling Democrats demonic. We're calling our bosses demonic. We're calling our bills demonic. We call our kids demonic. We call co-workers demonic anything and everything that we don't seem to understand or embrace we call it demonic and because we have misidentified people and practices as demonic we are busy fighting and overcoming each other instead of fighting and overcoming the truly demonic that is really opposing and oppressing us and so after addressing the racial the religious the ritualistic and the relational conflicts dividing the community called Ephesus, Paul or the writer concludes the message by both identifying that which is demonic and telling us how to deal with it. It's in the text. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual your wickedness in high places. Hear the text today. Your enemies are not the people that you can see, but your real enemies are the powers and the principalities that your human eye cannot see. Your real enemy is not the jerk you got to deal with on your job. Your real enemy is the principalities and power that still your joy and because these enemies are spiritual the writer of Ephesians 6 says in verse 11 and echoes it in verse 13 put on the whole armor of God so you can be able to stand or withstand the ways and the works of the devil for the devil is at the root of what is demonic. Not the caricature in a red suit with pointy horns, a pitchfork, and a tail. But if I can borrow from the work of my friend and New Testament scholar, Dr. Jeremy L. Williams, he conceptualizes devil as an acronym for domination, exploitation, and violence impacting lives. Don't miss it. I like it. He says devil is an acronym for domination, exploitation, and violence impacting lives. Repeat after me. Domination, exploitation, and violence impacting lives. That's what the devil is. That's what is the root of that which is demonic. That is the litmus test for identifying the demonic. Is it domination, exploitation, and violence impacting lives? If so, it is rooted in the devil and it is demonic. Demonic meaning contrary to the divine will. Demonic means an opposition to that which God stands for. For it is not God's will for you to have domination, exploitation, and violence impacting your life. It is not God's will for you to be a victim of domination, exploitation, and violence impacting your life. It is not God's will for you to be comfortable with domination, exploitation, and violence 
violence impacting your life. So God has sent me with a series of sermons that I don't even want to preach, but God is telling me I got to preach because somebody is dealing with the demonic, but they don't even know what the demonic is. But Dr. Jeremy Williams' acronym and the advice we get in Ephesians chapter 6 help us to identify what is truly demonic and our demonic enemies. And watch this, y'all. The text is telling us plainly and clearly that your identity is not demonic idolatry. That's the first point I need to leave. I slipped it right in on you, didn't I? The text is telling us in the first instance that your identity is not demonic idolatry. Yo, your identity is not demonic idolatry. Say it again, preacher. All right. Your identity, y'all, is not demonic idolatry. The text says in Ephesians 6 and 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The Greek says blood, hyema, and flesh, sarks. Hyema and sarks, blood and flesh. Hyema and sarks, a human body. Hyema systems and structures that are in the body. Sarks, that which is on the body. You, you don't get it? Let me break it down. The text says we do not wrestle against hyema, the systems and structures in the body, and we don't wrestle against sarks, that which is on the body. Because what is in our body and on our body is partly what makes up our identity. Jew or Gentile, black or white, Asian or Hispanic, that's just part of our identity. Male or female, tall or short, fully dressed or barely dressed, that's just part of our identity. Long hair, short hair, black hair, blonde hair, no hair or rainbow hair, that's just part Part of our identity. A Phi A, A K A, K A Psi, Omega Psi Phi, D S T Zeta Phi Beta, Phi Beta Sigma S G Rho, Iota Phi Theta is just part of your identity. Your school color, school songs, HBCU, college degree, high school diploma, or elementary school dropout. Hey, we don't worship this stuff. It's just part of of our identity. We don't worship schools or skin. We don't worship females or fraternities. We don't worship statuses or statues. We don't worship sororities or sisterhood. We don't worship expressions of demonic adultery, but these are only experiences and expressions of our cultural identity. Why do I say that? I say that because when European enslaved Africans in America, they did everything they could to take away Africans' identity by calling everything African demonic. They tried to devalue black skin by calling our melanated skin demonic. They took away black names and black language because they called it demonic. They tried to take away black rituals like ring shouts and drums because they called it demonic. They did all they could to take away the African identity by calling it demonic. But remember, Remember, y'all, that when Jesus hid out in Egypt among people of color in Africa, it was because his Palestinian Jewish skin blended in well with African skin. Remember, y'all, it was an Ethiopian in Acts chapter 8 who took the gospel into sub-Saharan Africa before it arrived in Rome. Remember that the oldest Christian church on the face of the planet 
said is the Coptic church of Ethiopia and Ethiopia has never been conquered and never been colonized by Europeans anywhere at any time but they took away all these things trying to identify or demonize our identity and say we did not have souls that were worthy of being saved they said the only heaven that our people were going to was a place called nigger heaven I hope I can say that we all family up in here they said the only heaven that we were going to was nigger heaven nigger heaven was the balcony of a white church during antebellum slavery some of y'all been to nigger heaven nigger heaven was the balcony of the movie theater or the back of the public bus during days of segregation and when you devalue and demonize your own identity you are doing the same thing that racists and misogynists and xenophobes and even homophobes and so many others have tried to do but the text says that walking in your identity is not demonic idolatry because we wrestle not against school songs that's identity we wrestle against self-serving spirits that's demonic idolatry we don't wrestle against divine nine fraternities and sororities that's identity we wrestle against domination that's demonic idolatry we don't wrestle against cultural expression that's identity we wrestle against capitalistic exploitation that's demonic idolatry we don't wrestle against virtues that celebrate love that's identity we wrestle against violence that promotes hate that's demonic idolatry we don't wrestle against people that's identity but we wrestle against principalities and against powers that's demonic idolatry and when somebody tries to demonize you for being black or demonize you for being female or demonize you from being from the ghetto or demonize you because of what you wear or demonize you because of where you went to school or demonize you because of who and where you are and who and where you live respond to demonization by saying my identity is not idolatry and my identity is not demonic the text is telling us, the text is telling us, the text is telling us in the first instance that identity, your identity is not demonic idolatry. Then the second thing the text is trying to tell us today to help us, it moves from the negative by telling us what is not into the affirmative telling us what it is. Watch this y'all. The second thing that the text tells us is that the demonic is bigger than you. Not only, not only, not only is your identity not idolatry, but, but the demonic is bigger than you. Understand, understand, understand today that we limit our understanding of the demonic to the experience of our personal problems. We think that the demonic are the jerks that we got to deal with on our job. We, we call the demonic the pain that's in our back or the ache that's in our elbow. We call the demonic the bills that are in the mailbox. We call the demonic the stuff that we have to do that we just don't feel like doing but I'm here to tell you that the demonic is something that is much bigger than that for in the text of Ephesians chapter 6 around about verse number 12 the text says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities that's bigger than you against powers that's bigger than you against the rulers of the darkness of this age that's bigger than you against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. That is bigger than you. And while we can try to get some sort of understanding of what the text says in the English, the Greek uses words like exousia. Exousia is a word referencing 
superhuman authority and supernatural strength. The text uses words like arche. Arche means a power that existed at commencement. It means something that was there at the beginning when God brought order into chaos. Exousia is, 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 is superhuman. Uh, arche is commencement of a power there before. Spiritual wickedness, poneria, means spiritual depravity. What you are up against is not people, it's depravity. What you are up against, it is not someone, it is systems. What we are up against is not issues, it is ignorance. What we are up against are not things, but it's powers and principalities that are bigger than us, that are stronger than us, and was there even before us. What are you trying to say, preacher? I'm trying to say that if it's just people, then you can deal with it on your own because where I come from, we ain't scared of people. There ain't a person in my hood who could beat me. And everybody in the hood I came from had the same mentality. If all I got to fight with is people, I can outthink them. If all I got to fight with are people, I can outmuscle them. If all I got to fight with are people, I can outdress them. I can outspend them. But the text says it's not people. It's something superhuman. It's something at a much higher level. It is something that is older than me, that is larger than me, that is stronger than me. And that's what makes it demonic understand my friends you often talk about and we often hear it talked about that I'm under attack but sometimes being under attack in our limited minds it means that there's somebody who doesn't agree with me we often say I'm under attack but under attack in our limited minds means I spent my rent money at the club and now there's a five day notice on my door we often say things like I'm under attack but what we truly mean in our limited mind is I find myself laying down with laziness and don't want to get back up. But when you realize and recognize that your understanding of the demonic is limited, then the way you deal with it will be limited too. Because when I hear Greek words like exousia, authority, or strength, when I read Greek words like arche, meaning there from the beginning, when God brought order out of chaos. When I read Greek words like poneria, like spiritual depravity, it makes me understand that it's beyond my weight class, that I can't fight it by myself, that I can't fix it on my own, that if I mess with it, I'll fall. But I realize and recognize that this is something demonic and I need God to take care of this thing for me. Is there anybody up in here who ever has been in a fight? Not just a fight for your, for your love, but a fight for your life. A fight for your life. A fight for your soul. A fight for your faith. A fight for your family. Have you ever had to fight for your future and fight for your promise? Fight for your peace and fight for God's promise. That's why you keep coming to church Sunday after Sunday. That's why you get in the word and read your devotionals on weekdays that's why you sing the songs of Zion even if you got to sing off key that's why you're not bothered by others who sit and say nothing and do nothing they don't stop you from saying I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise will continually be in my mouth because you're in a battle that you can't win by yourself you're in a battle with the demonic. You're in a battle with something bigger. You're in a battle with something older. You're in a battle with something stronger. You're in a battle that will save your soul if you can win. And in a battle like that, you've got to understand that it's not really your battle to fight for you, but you need God to fight that thing for you. God has got to fight this battle because I'm not wrestling against 
flesh and blood, but I'm wrestling against principalities and against power. God has got to fight this battle because I'm fighting against the rulers of the darkness of this age. God has got to fight this battle because I'm fighting against spiritual hosts of wickedness in high places. My hands aren't strong enough. My muscles aren't big enough. My eyes aren't sharp enough. My feet aren't sturdy enough. My knees aren't locked enough. But I need the Lord to step in and fight my battles. If it's demonic, let the Lord fight it. If it's from the devil, let God deal with it. If it's something that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy, stand still and let the Lord fight your battles. So then the text tells us in the first instance that, I, that identity is not demonic idolatry. But then the text tells us in the second instance that the demonic is bigger than you. But then third and finally, watch this, y'all. The text tells us that that which is demonic requires you to face it with everything you got. The, the, the text, the text, the text says that when something is truly demonic, you have got to face it with everything you got. What, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? The text says put on the whole armor of God. The text is interesting today because if we accept traditional understandings of authorship of Ephesians, traditional understandings of authorship, says that Paul wrote this epistle to the churches and Christian communities in Ephesus. But it says that Paul was writing them while he himself was locked up. He was not locked up in a traditional prison cell, but he was locked up in a cell of his own because the traditional understanding says he was handcuffed to a Roman soldier to make sure that he could not escape the state of imprisonment that they saw him in. I don't know if Paul was right-handed or left-handed. I don't know if it was his left hand or his right hand that was chained to a Roman official. But I believe that Paul may have been ambidextrous, that no matter what hand was locked up, he used his free hand to pen the letter that we now call the book of Ephesians. And as Paul began to look at and consider the, the fact that the faithful were in a spiritual war, the, he began to conclude warning and illustration uh, of exactly what they needed in order to win the battle. Uh, he thought about all of his sports analogies uh, and said running track won't work. Uh, I've used that one. Uh, he looked at all of his historical records uh, and said my history won't work. Uh, I've already used that one. Uh, but then he looked at the man uh, to whom's hand he was handcuffed. Uh, and he saw something in the Roman soldier that, that he said would be useful for those who are fighting the demonic. And so he said in his letter the, to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the works, words, and workings of the devil. In other words, when you find yourself facing the demonic, you've got to face it with everything you got to fix it preacher okay if you can give it money and your problem goes away I want to submit it's not the demonic if you can take a Tylenol and the headache goes away I want to submit it's not the demonic if you can simply move to another physical location and escape the predicament that you are in I want to claim that you are not having an experience with the demonic uh, because the demonic cannot be fought with your finances. Uh, the demonic cannot be fought with the medication. Uh, the demonic cannot be fought with a change in your location.
temptation. Uh, but is there anybody up in here uh, who knows that when the spirits come against you, uh, you got to face it with everything that you got? Uh, is there anybody up in here uh, who can play the role of Paul in the text? Uh, you find yourself in a battle. Uh, and if you are honest with yourself, uh, you feel like you just might lose. Uh, you've been trying to stay calm, uh, but you feel like you're going to lose the battle. Uh, you've been trying to stay strong, uh, but you feel like you're going to lose the battle. Uh, you've been trying to stay saved, uh, but you feel like you might lose the battle. Uh, you've been trying not to cuss folk out, uh, but you feel like you're going to lose the battle. Uh, you've been trying not to give up, uh, but you feel like you may lose the battle uh, because your patience is wearing thin, uh, because everything is getting on your nerves, uh, because your parents didn't raise no punk, uh, because you ain't always been godly, uh, and there's some ghetto in you, uh, and these enemies are testing your gangster. Uh, I hear Paul say, put on uh, the whole armor of God. Uh, the Greek word in the text for put on uh, is indumam. Uh, indumam means to wear it like a robe, uh, not a two-piece or a three-piece, uh, but indomam means put on like a robe. Uh, it's a one-piece uh, that covers you from head to toe. Uh, so when we hear Paul say put on the whole armor, uh, we start to think about the, belt, the helmet of truth uh, or the belt of truth uh, and the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, we think about the sandals of the gospel uh, and we think about the shield of faith. Uh, we think about the helmet of salvation uh, and we think about the sword of the spirit uh, and we assume he's talking about six pieces uh, but the Greek suggests uh, that Paul is not talking about six pieces uh, but he's talking about one hole uh, and while there's no Greek word for hole uh, it is the word panoplia used for armor but panoplia is a compound word it means that in all forms it means that in all parts hoopline means utensils or twos put on the armor endomai panoplia it suggests that it's impossible to take only part of it because the armor exists as the whole of it it's not just one thing but you gotta put on the whole thing you got to be covered from head all the way down to your toes. You got to cover your head. For the Bible says, be ye transformed through the renewing of your mind. You got to cover your chest because the Bible says that as a man or woman thinketh in their heart, so is he or so is she. You got to cover your arms because I hear the Bible say that the joy of the Lord, it gives me strength. You got to cover your legs because I hear the Bible say that the steps of a good person have been ordered by the Lord. You got to cover your feet for we walk by faith and not by sight. And when you're dealing with the demonic, you've even got to cover your back. I hear the Bible say that surely, surely, surely goodness and mercy have got my back following me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Is there anybody here who's been dealing with the demonic? Is there anybody here who has found yourself under a spiritual attack? I hear the songwriter say he is all over me and he is keeping me alive it's not my money he is all over me it is not my doctor he is all over me it is not my friends he is all over me it's not my good diet but my god is all over me 
and he's keeping me alive. He's on the right and the left. He's in front and in back. He's over me and under me, and he's keeping me alive. Is there anybody here still alive by his grace, still alive by his mercy, still alive by his power? You ought to give God a praise. He's delivering you in the midst of the demonic. Wherefore put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand to withstand because the demonic don't take days off put on the whole armor your regular enemies get tired but when you wrestle against rulers and principalities put on the whole armor of God so you might be able to withstand the works the weapons the words the tricks the traps of the enemy. The demonic is not in your identity. The demonic is bigger than you. When it's demonic, you've got to face it with everything you got. Not just your money, not just your therapist, not just those videos you watch on YouTube. Not just from 8.30 to 8.45. You've got to face it with everything you got. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But in this fight, you've got to put on the whole armor of God. Come on, Jay. This ought to be a testimony today that he's all over me and he's keeping me alive. The devil, the demonic wanted me to be dead, but I'm only here because he, my God, is all over me and he's keeping me alive. Don't give the credit to anything or anybody else. All the credit belongs to God. Come on, come on, come on, come on. He is all, he's all. That's a testimony. Because I shouldn't be here right now. But my testimony is God did it. Because he was all over me. From that day to this day, he's still keeping me alive. What's he doing? Come on and put them hands together. Put them hands together. If that's your witness, if that's your story, if that's your testimony, that you didn't do it by yourself, but it was God, it was God, it was God, it was God. I know, I know, I know. As we stand to our feet, the doors of the church are open, the doors are open, the doors are open. The doors are open today. Listen, there may be someone here who came into the house. Somebody was scrolling and stopped watching us online. Beloved, you are not here by accident. You are not here by coincidence. You are with us in the house and online by divine appointment. 